This is Weavers Beyond the Numbers Real Estate Podcast. I'm Rob Nowak, real estate industry tax partner with Weaver. And that good looking guy next to me is Howard Altshuler, Weaver's partner in charge of real estate services. Today, Howard's going to jump into the Wayback Machine. He's going to walk us through the evolution of revenue recognition going back from to 2014 and walking us forward to the present. This podcast is intended for informational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said here constitutes professional advice. If you have a question, you can call Weaver for help. Also go to weaver.com to find all of our content, live casts, white papers, and more. That's weaver.com. Howard, certainly one of my favorite topics from a tax perspective, <laughs> revenue recognition, but that takes on a whole different spin when we're talking about um, financial accounting and auditing standards. So why don't you start us off? Sure. And, and I'm not going to necessarily walk through as much. So I'm just going to hyper jump. Um, but basically in 2014, the FASB first put out um, the re new revenue recognition standard, which is codified in 606. Um, prior to that, from a real estate sales perspective, everybody was following the old guidance, which was the original FAS 66. And FAS 66 had some prescriptive um, requirements that would enable a company to recognize revenue on a real estate sale. Um, primarily, you know, they had to transfer title. That's kind of a given. Um, you had to have either a really strong down payment or kind of all cash. Um, you had to um, limit the amount of future participation um, with the project once it was sold and a few other things, but that was primarily it. And so what ended up happening was basically real estate sales, if you see the PSA, are usually for all cash or no seller, seller provided financing. Properties mm -hmm. are kind of as is, where is, no future involvement, no guarantees, no future development, just, you know, just kind of, we're washing our hands of this and, and doing that. Right. So when 606 came out, it went from that rules-based approach to more of a con uh, concepts-based approach. And some of those concepts were a little bit different. And what it does is it primarily puts things in the context of a performance obligation. So mm -hmm. you have, when you go into an agreement, you have a performance obligation to provide a property. Okay. That's what you're selling. Okay. But at the same time, you may also have, you know, a performance obligation to do a little bit of development work, you know, on the back end of the property. Um, or like maybe, you know, finish up some stuff or maybe add a wing. Or there may be some type of um, arrangement to where there's, you know, guaranteeing a certain amount of um, NOI from the property mm -hmm. um, or cost mm -hmm. sharing or revenue sharing agreement with the buyer mm -hmm. and all that. And, and all that is creates, you know, different purchase obligations and different values um, from that pro above and beyond just what's the cost of selling the building. Okay. Or the, the price of selling the building. And so all those would be looked at from a different perspective. OK, and so basically the other part that gets considered here is collectability. Instead of there being a prescriptive, you have to have 20 percent down, 25 percent down, a seven year amortization on note. You kind of go, is this note collectible or not? Um, you know, the purchase price. And then that gets factored into it as well. And so what ends up happening is each of these gets looked at as a separate performance obligation and therefore becomes a separate revenue recognition item. So far, so good. So far, so good. I got okay. a couple of questions, but keep going. Okay. So in essence, what's happening is if you have continuing involvement, which was always kind of a big no-no um, from the 66 standpoint, now you can say, okay, we have continuing involvement. We're selling a property for, you know, uh, 10 million bucks. 9 million of it is the property. 1 million of it is the continuing involvement. So we're going to say, we're going to recognize the 9 million today as a sale and revenue recognition. And then we're gonna deal with the 1 million as we deal with the continuing involvement. And so what's what happens there is it gives the, the company an opportunity to structure the sales agreements um, in a way that could be a little bit more creative to provide mm -hmm. value for the buyer, maybe provide value for the seller as well, mm -hmm. above and beyond just the price of the property um, and still not blow up your financial accounting. So you're talking about this in a real estate context. This is a mm -hmm. real estate podcast. We also Correct. do work with contractors as well. Does this have an application to construction con as well? Not so much because construction was kind of always on a percentage of completion basis before. And that really hasn't changed so much with the, with the new standard. But is there, if you were to take, let's say, a construction contract, a general, you know, general conditions contract, um, is there a thought that you would have to break that down into plumbing, into electrical uh, you know, site improvement, things like that. 
it depends. The the standard refers to what's separate and distinct performance obligations. Okay. So if you if you can't if you can't necessarily separate the plumbing and the electric the electrical and the landscape landscaping maybe, but the plumbing, mm-hmm. the electrical, the structural from the building, you look at it as one big contract. Yeah, I can't stump you. I tried, but you, but <laughs> you, know, you know this stuff. Um, what can clients do if if this is let's say going to be the first time that they're dealing with this concept? What can they do to prepare themselves and prepare them to deal with the auditors? Well, I think the first thing is really it's a matter. The, the first thing is a matter of recognizing that this is out there, because again, you know, the reason that every single purchase agreement that you see looks the same is because I believe the accounting people told the deal people you have to structure it like this 